Yeah. And I just realized I lied to y'all. Um, I thought you meant how many TVs we have in that room. We have four TVs. Oh, there we go. We have four TVs in the house, but only one in the open concept kitchen living room. Remember when we first met John McClain? Argyle picked him up from the plane and took him down to Nakatomi Tower at the Christmas party. And the terrorists were overzealous, but it was sweet when they killed Ellis. And with a little help from Alan, John McClain kicked out. Welcome back to Chat the Movies, the podcast where we answer the question were the movies we loved when we were growing up really that good? Have you ever caught yourself thinking, why don't they make movies like they used to? Can you still remember spending your Friday night searching for the perfect movie rental at Blockbuster Video? Do you know what Blockbuster Video is? If you answered yes, then this is the podcast for you. I am one of your hosts, Gene Lyons. Alongside me are my co-hosts, Ash Freudian Nightmare Avery. Hi, y'all. And Big D Dick Ebert. Good evening. And each week, we take a look back in time and decide if our favorite films still hold up. The movies we cover are chosen by you, the listeners, who generously commission the films you love. If you'd like to see all the movies we have covered, will cover, or want to choose one for yourself, please visit shatpod.com and have a look. At the end of each podcast, we'll provide you, the audience, with the number of wipes each movie would take to get off your respective butts. So thank you so much for listening. If you have not already, hit that subscribe button and share with a friend. That's how we help the podcast grow. Additionally, subscribe to our sister podcast, Shat on TV, where we TV series such as Westworld, Taboo, American Gods, Game of Thrones, True Detective, Lovecraft Country, and Watchmen. Find all that information and past episodes once again at our new website, shatpod.com. Finally, <laughs> yes. to hang out with us live all week long, follow and subscribe to our Twitch channel, shatthemovies.com slash Twitch, where you play video games, host watch parties, and edit this podcast live. All that being said, big D of shatpod.com, what movie are we reviewing today? Well, Gene, first let me address the new website, chatpod.com. People might be saying, why change the web name? Why would you guys do that? Well, we've been running two full websites. We have TV, we have the movies, we have some other activities that we do, Twitch, gaming. So in order to make everything simpler and to get our audience to consume all of our products at Chat, I've gone through the process years now, chatpod.com forward slash movies or forward slash TV. And all of our exciting new endeavors will come out on that one podcast. You can email us still at all of them until we get them all switched over. But go check it out. It uh, should be a good experience for everyone. It also makes us less vulnerable to RICO laws. So mm-hmm. <laughs> Exactly. So, Gene, this week, I'm very excited. One of our listeners in the UK, Paul C., asked us to go back in time and to review the 1988 comedy classic starring Judge Reinhold and Fred Savage. Vice versa. Well, they write in and said, hey, Shat Crew, firstly, thank you for doing such an amazing job. Your podcast is amazing, never fails to make me laugh. And I've been listening since the summer of 2018 and listened to all of them at least once, and many have been repeated many times. Commando, Predator, Total Recall, etc. Spot the trend. I always recommend the podcast to friends and have never heard anybody say it wasn't for them. I've chosen Vice Versa for you to review as it's one of those films from both my and my brother's James's childhood that we still talk about, quote, and even have a little back and forth of lyrics from the Malice concert song, too. It holds a very special place. I also still want a guitar synthesizer after watching this film, and it took a few years to find out what a major ball breaker is. For sure, it's dated in parts, and Reinhold and Savage aren't for everyone, but it's got all the right ingredients for a good time film that I can't wait to share with my children in a few years' time. Looking forward to what you have to say and keep up the amazing work. Thank you again, Paul C. from the UK. You know, Paul, I was surprised at how much I enjoyed this movie, but I think your pattern of films that you like, including Commando, Predator, Total Recall, etc., I did spot the trend. And now I feel like less satiated with vice versa, because this is a movie that was made for Arnold Schwarzenegger, and it's a fucking pity he wasn't in it. I mean, in in the Judge Reinhold role, not in the Fred Savage role. (laughs) Agree. Well, Vice Versa is a 1988 comedy starring Judge Reinhold and Fred Savage. It is the fourth big screen adaptation of F. Anstey's 1882 novel of the same name, following the British films released in 1916, 1937, and 1948. There's also a 1981 UK television series starring Peter Bowles and Ian Cuthbertson, which proves Gene Lyons' theory that UK television is garbage. Uh, Big D, Ash, we always ask what your memories are of the movie we're covering. Uh, I'll go first. I'm kind of surprised I'd never seen this movie before. 
Uh, my older cousin used to go to the video store and he would rent anything that Judge Reinhold was in. Like he was a massive fan. Judge Reinhold is prominently on this cover doing some sort of like RCA like skateboard ad uh, on the on a desk. Yeah. You know, th- th- those weird like 80s covers that never would happen in real life where he's looking directly at the camera, like look at how much fun I'm having. But I love The Princess Bride, which came out a year before Vice Versa. And I was obsessed with The Wonder Years. So you have Judge Reinhold that my cousin loved. You got Fred Savage that I loved. This really should have been a movie that I had seen. And the only reason I could think that I didn't see it is that Vice Versa came out a few months before Big. And Big was, mm-hmm. true to its name, a huge movie in my childhood that we watched dozens of times. And I think people just didn't hear about this because Big was so big. So Hollywood has never had a problem being unoriginal. They usually get like some kind of an idea and you'll get a group of movies that come out in a short period of time. If I said to you, Earth Impact movies, what would you think about? 90s. Yeah. Come up with a couple of them. Can you think of Armageddon? Yeah. Deep Impact. There you go. Uh, Traveling to the center of the Earth. The Core. There you go. There's one of them. I don't remember what the other one was. Uh, Journey to the center of the Earth. No. Volcano movies. (laughs) Volcano. Dante's Peak. Dante's Peak. There you go. You got them. So this was another genre. This is what I call the body switch craze of the 80s. So early on, we had one of the Lily Tomlin, my favorite one, was called All of Me. And Lily Tomlin, she's accidentally transferred into the body of Steve Martin. Gene, you mentioned Big with Tom Hanks, makes a wish to Zoltar. 18 again, George Burns has his soul transplanted into the body of his 18-year-old. I think it's his grandson or somebody affiliated with the family. Dream a little dream. We get the soul of the elderly professor, Jason Robart, who enters the body of Corey Feldman, who is doing some kind of Michael Jackson impersonation. Very strange. And tonight's movie, vice versa. This was 88. However, I was 15 when this came out, and I had no interest in seeing this. And don't forget 1994's Stargate. That's not a body swap. It absolutely is. That's how Ron does it. Oh, but that's not the premise. We don't get to see him having hijinks like, hey, I'm really raw in the body of a child. No, he had sexual hijinks all over the place. <laughs> he did. He's a drag queen. Well, I'm very disappointed that you mentioned the trend of the 80s that was really started in 1976 with the great Walt Disney classic Jodie Foster in Freaky Friday. Because that is what this movie basically is, but with dudes. And so I had never heard of this movie uh, until it went up on our schedule. I have to be really honest. I'm embarrassed to say this. As far as Judge Reinhold goes, I know him from Fast Times, but I really know him from Arrested Development, you know, and when he plays the judge, Judge Reinhold. Um, So I didn't have a lot to offer in terms of like pre-knowledge of this movie. So I went into it with fresh eyes, except for my love of both the 1976 Freaky Friday and the 2003 Jamie Lee Curtis classic with Lindsay Lohan remake of Freaky Friday. So no offense to uh, Paul C, but I might be doing some more like plot explanation on this one because from the people I've talked to who are listeners of this podcast, a lot of people have not seen vice versa. So just be prepared for that. And with that, let's hit the trailer. Stop dumping on me, Dad. I've been up since six, and I have a very tough day ahead. I wish I could change places with you. Well, I wish I could, too. Inside Marshall Seymour, successful businessman, divorced father, and self-styled workaholic beats the heart of a little boy. Because Marshall Seymour is about to become his 11-year-old son... Charlie. Awesome. And vice versa. Maybe this happened all over America. What's going to happen to you? You're six foot two with the brain of an 11 year old. Charlie may be getting to that age. He's losing it. Uh huh. I think he has a crush on me. No way! You never told me you had to see my home room teacher. You never told me what had you practice. Mine. This is the woman I couldn't live with as a husband. And now I'm going to be her son. I'll do anything you want, Sam. It's not what I want. It's what we want as a unit. She's worried about your unit, Dad. It's a Freudian nightmare. Judge Reinhold. Are you all right? Do I look all right? Fred Savage. I don't suppose you have any great poop on. Vice versa. What if we're stuck like this? Oh, my God. I have to go through puberty again. 
Marshall Seymour is the vice president of a Chicago department store. He is divorced and has a son named Charlie, whom he has little time for. He and his girlfriend, Sam, travel to Thailand to purchase exotic merchandise for the department store. While they're there, an art thief named Turk is trying to smuggle a stolen relic out of Thailand. He puts it with one of Marshall's purchases so that he and his accomplice, Lillian Brookmeyer, can make the switch. All right, so... I've had this issue with so many tomb raiding shrine heist movies to date. You've always got this sort of like magical relic or some object of improbable power and no fucking security. Like you've got literally (laughs) hundreds of monks in this movie. They're all hanging out in their big robes, but they leave the reincarnation skull unattended. And I recently learned, because I didn't really know what monks did, but I was looking into uh, like Trappist ales and Abbey ales. And if there's one thing monks have, it's plenty of time for absolutely boring shit, like staring at a skull all day. I don't know if you guys know this, but like there were monks that were at one point assigned to the Bible and they would just Hmm. count how many times a word appeared. They would read through the entire Old Testament and count how many times. So they'd be like, in. And then you have to go through and count how many times in appears and then the do that because they were looking for some secret code in there. That's how much time monks have. Have at least two, four, six guys watching the skull at all times. Yeah, but I imagine that they're meditating. I think that's probably a big thing that they do. And if you're just kind of relaxed and you're peaceful, they're not the best to have like high security items because they're like, ah, somebody really going to steal it? I don't don't know. But you need them to be slackers in order for this movie to happen. But the beginning, it's jarring. This is the first time I've seen this movie, and it opens with Raiders of the Lost Ark level tension. There's like jungle chases and people running and like you know the, the monks are gathering all of their, their weapons and going after them. And then it's quick smash cut to like Chicago in Christmas time with Christmas songs. It was very confusing. Yeah, I have to tell you, I was making ramen while the opening of this movie was going on. So I turned like our TVs on like a swivel thing on the wall. And so like I swiveled it out. So I was in the kitchen, like finishing up the ramen and cracking the egg over it. And then all of a sudden I look and so I see it, I'm watching it. And then I look down and I pick up the ramen and then we're in Chicago. And I was like, oh, wait. I thought maybe like Amazon Prime like played a trailer before the actual movie and Uh that's what I was watching. So I went back, I sat down, unswiveled the TV and watched it again from the beginning just to make sure that that like jump cut was that violently quick. And it was. Um, But I do have to say that despite the transitions, which I'll complain about again, spoiler alert, um, I did think that the actual skull was pretty badass. Like in a lot of these movies, including Raiders, like it looks like something like that you can buy from like the Halloween section at Michael's. Like it looks really stupid, but I like that this one, it's like this weird mixed metal thing going on. You can put it on its crown. You can put it on its skull face. You can move its jaw up and down. It's got this cool kind of vibe going. I was like, all right, they spent a little bit of money on propage. I don't mean this in, a judgmental way at all, Ash, but just my perception of you is I imagined that in your kitchen, you would have those like iPad holders connected to like right above the cooking area and then maybe over the sink as well so that you could like do your recipes and stuff on there or like watch the movie while you're doing that. You're telling me you just have a TV? Yes, we have one TV. That's, that's it. I don't know why you would think that all my recipes are on paper. Well, I just – it's that – it's that uh, – I don't want to use the term Martha Stewart-ness. No. You. Ew. No, I picture – I give the- off a – hold on. I give off a Martha Stewart vibe. How many tubs of Mardi Gras decorations do you have? Oh, you went, you went there. Well, that's yeah. different. I'm spirited. I'm not Martha Stewart. <laughs> yeah. Jane, I pictured more she would have someone hold the iPad <laughs> and just follow her around the house. Right. I just said I was making ramen, not making some gourmet (laughs) meal. Let's go back to that. Lower, Pierre. Lower. (laughs) Lower the iPad. (laughs) I hate you both. When we did Monster Squad, we got taken to task for not highlighting the fine job David Proval did in Monster Squad. He was the pilot uh, where Dracula like fell out of the back of his of his uh, the Bombay doors that he for some reason had on his plane. Anyway, when we did that. Several listeners wrote in, called in, hit me up on Twitter, and they and they were like, hey, that's Richie from The Sopranos. Like, give the man his due. Yes, David Proval did a wonderful job in Monster Squad. He's excellent in The Sopranos. He's like a sadistic, you know, maniac. And 
I got to say, he's absolutely fantastic as like this oddly nuanced hood in this movie. Like he's not just some generic bad guy. He's got like this weird, like slightly soft spot for kids. And he kind of brings like a comedic grit to the movie. Like the guy's funny without being like goofy. There's a scene where, you know, he's trying to suss out uh, Marshall and, and his date in Thailand. And he goes to take a picture of them and he's having like a slight, a small conversation with them. And they're like, where are you from? And he's like, England. And I was sold. I'm like, the guy's amazing. Yeah. I, I hope he shows up in the movie and he, he gets quite a bit of screen time. Yeah, I totally agree. The movie for what it is, I'm surprised at the level of the actors who they've gotten. But my favorite is James Hong. He plays Quo. He's the, if in the 80s or 90s, you had a script and you're in Hollywood and it called for, uh, let's just say the stereotypical quote, mystical Asian character. James Hong was your man. He was the default choice. 80s and 90s movies, he's everywhere. Blade Runner, Wayne's World 2, Silent Fury, Ninja 3, The Domination. He was in two of the Blood Sports, Tango and Cash, Big Trouble in Little China, The Golden Child. This dude was everywhere and he makes me smile. But I just felt bad for him because he's obviously getting taken advantage of here by Turk. This is a brazen midday robbery of like the monastery. The monks are coming after him. He's got to know what this thing is worth. Like I said, it's beautiful. It's covered in diamonds and gold. It, you know this is worth something. So when he gets like a low ball offer of five grand, I'm feeling terrible for him. He just got taken advantage of. Well, maybe these monks are like super chill and not very alert, but maybe they're like a fucking assassin squad. So he's got to move this shit very quickly because when the monks find out you've got the skull, like, like they're coming. But I was proud of vice versa for letting – uh, James Hong actually play a non-mystical character like he just plays a broker here but then they had to fill the mystical Asian role later in the movie when they had the llama the guru so they got Harry Yorku uh, later in the film who apparently has like some like strong uh, pull in the Aikido community but and he's been in a few movies I think he did um, summer rental or whatever with John Candy I think he was in that but but anyway I, I get the two of them confused all the time so I'm glad that they used both of them to a uh, great effect in this movie God, that sounded way more racist than I expected. God, wasn't, I he, wasn't he Yakov really Smirnoff? <laughs> oh, that's a different. The comedian no, you're thinking of the guy that's Spider-Man's landlord. No, no, no. This is Spider-Man's you're, landlord. Yeah, that's the professor. I'm not talking about the professor. I'm talking about the llama. Right, but I'm saying that Elsie Baskins was in the Spider-Man movies. I like that you, Elsie Baskins. <laughs> yeah, he was in the Spider-Man movies. He was the professor. He wasn't the llama. The llama was an Asian guy who's played by Harry Yorku. You remember he like came from Nepal. He was hiding out in mm-hmm. New York. He was in okay. like the weird tropical tent. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Which <laughs> I won't even go there, but yeah, you're right, Ash. It was kind of <laughs> it was out of place. I expected Axel Foley to make a bust in there. It was, <laughs> like, it was weird. Yeah. And I just realized I lied to y'all. Um, I thought you meant how many TVs we have in that room we have four TVs. Oh, there we go we have four tvs in the house but only one in the open concept kitchen living room okay but- walk me through so one's in the playroom i'm sure right? yes we have uh, we have one in the playroom one's in the open concept kitchen slash living room slash living room our bedroom your bedroom yeah, we have one. I never our- would have. I would. I thought you would have been like a books only in the books and like so I, toys. I don't ever watch it in there. That one's not for me. Okay. Um, and then um, we have one in the uh, the like sitting room. Does Pierre have one in the servant shed? <laughs> Pierre doesn't deserve a TV. No, we don't have a servant's quarter. We have a garage. They make him him carry around one of those like combination VCR TV (laughs) things just because it's funny. Like the the big antenna. Um, So in this part, back to the movie. In this part of the movie, um, we get to this jump to Thailand. And again, was I the only one who thought that this switch was also really random? Like all of a sudden they're in like a tropical area and they're on a boat and it's this massive boat. And for some reason, Everyone is dressed all in white, including Judge Reinholdt, who is in a full white suit in a tropical climate. Um, He looked like he was going to die a heat stroke. And then they switch from that and they go to the Thai show, which is like 
their version of like a gross like tourist luau type thing complete with like these umbrella drinks that his girlfriend takes a picture with and then their girlfriend himself who i think is actually really cute she's sitting there in that weird pastel muumu with a half turban headband and like the whole thing just feels so completely out of place and i'm like what's happening in this movie but thankfully we immediately switch right back to chicago so quickly to a boardroom that we don't really have to think about it much but for me this movie felt a, like a a lot of whiplash up until this point. Yeah, but the Thailand scenes made me so nostalgic for 80s American tourists in Asia. Like you watch lots of music videos did this, movies did this. And it's just like Americans were unabashedly tourists. They would do things like wear suits on like river boats and they didn't give a fuck. And I'll take that any day over what social media influencers are doing these days. Because now, like, if you're on, like, Instagram or TikTok, it's all, like, that blending in with the locals thing, right? Like, they want to look Thai and act Thai. <laughs> it's, it borders on cultural appropriation. It bothers me so much. Listen, Americans, you're never going to be one of them. Like, the, here's, what, here's how to be a good tourist. Go spend the money. Be polite. And please don't Southeast Asian cosplay, right? Just, just be fucking cool. Tip well. You know. Stick to tourist places. It's okay. No, I disagree. I'll take the Asian cosplay over Jake Paul fucking going to like the Japanese suicide forest and being the the loud American like that. Just how about you just go and don't Instagram everything? Let's do that, people. Well, you missed the be polite part. And it's a go looking for hanging bodies in the forest and Jake Paul out. Go and enjoy it. You don't need to show the world how cool you are. Just go and have fun. When Marshall returns, he spends time with Charlie while his mother and stepfather are on vacation. While holding the skull, father and son get in an argument about how they wish they could be in each other's bodies. Charlie grows up into Marshall's body, and Marshall shrinks into Charlie's body. After the initial shock, they realize they must live out their lives as each other. Marshall heads off to school, while Charlie assumes his father's role as vice president from an 11-year-old's viewpoint. Marshall and Charlie talk with Professor Kirchner, who wishes to show the skull to a llama before giving it back to them. So before they body swap, we get to see a little bit of the dynamics between Charlie and his dad. And I have to say, like, I totally get Charlie here. Like, he's got this dad who wants, like, nothing to do with him. He doesn't know him at all. And then at dinner, y'all, when Judge Reinhold is just going on and on about, he's got his chest. He's got the test to do. Like, not even anything <laughs> specific. Just, like, his academics. And then the next day, like, whining about his mess and his granola. Like, I, I get it. I wouldn't want anything to do with my dad if he acted like that. And I think this is where my comparison to Freaky Friday makes me have a little bit of an issue with this movie. It's because like in the 2003 remake with Jamie Lee Curtis, you get why Jamie Lee Curtis is so stressed all the time because Lindsay Lohan's character is a little bit of an asshole too. Like she's an asshole teenager. And so you get that they just don't get each other. Not that one is shitty and one isn't. They just don't get each other. And here, like Charlie, he's badass. And his dad, he's just kind of a an asshole. He's badass he sneaks a frog into his dad's house and uh, puts it in the him. sink and doesn't say anything to save his life he didn't have to bring him in the first place i draw the line at fucking wildlife and domestic pets you gotta announce when you're bringing them into the house it should be it should be like customs you gotta it's declare that there's an animal in your pocket it's a frog <laughs> i used to bring frogs them. into my house as a kid you lived in the swamp yeah that's different he's in <laughs> chicago fine <laughs> <laughs> Listen, maybe y'all had magic dads in the 80s, but all I had was my friend's dads, and those dudes were non-existent. Like, you'd sometimes yeah. see them, like, maybe you were creeping through the house to the bathroom, and you open a door to the den, and there's just a guy with glasses, and he turns around like, oh, shit. You know, sometimes they'd be in the garage, like, just smoking cigarettes and listening to baseball and, like, tinkering with cars. But no dad, not one that I encountered in 1988 was deeply interested in what the kids were doing or hanging out with the kids or our interests. They knew that you might have had tests, but that's about it. Except Mormon dads. They're a whole different category. That makes me so sad. I didn't have a Mormon dad, but I had like a super involved dad. Like he used to go and like work with all the local businesses when I had sleepovers to do these massive scavenger hunts that he led us on throughout like all of like uptown New Orleans. Like he was completely involved. He was nothing like this guy. He was awesome. No, I, I think Gene, I, I experienced what he did. Very few dads were involved. I think that's more of a modern thing that we've, I, th I think it's better. It's maybe it's because now all the fathers are like, Hey, do you like star Wars? Yeah. <laughs> let's watch the Mandalorian. Yeah. Boba Fett. Woo! 
you know, back in the day, what the hell was my dad going to sit down? Like, you know, what did he have from his childhood he could share? But I need us to set the ground rules here if we can. How are we going to refer to these characters going forward? Because if we start saying Marshall, Judge Reinhold, Charlie, Fred Savage, how will we define? Because I could be talking about Charlie, but Charlie could be in Marshall's body. How do you no, think we should we do talk it? about their soul, not their physical person. So Charlie is Charlie and Marshall's Marshall. And it's okay. an important thing before we get an um, actually, that they don't technically body swap. Right. They actually change yeah, they into transform. the other one. So they transform. Yeah, it's a tra- it's a body transformation film more than a body swap film. So that's why it's not a ripoff of any of these other movies. But so Marshall mm. is the dad and Charlie is the son, regardless of what they look like. But it might just be easier to go <laughs> with the actor's name. <laughs> I like that. Well, I'm I'm going to refer to them by their their actor's name. I think that's what I'm going to do so that our listeners who maybe have not seen this movie in a while can keep up with it. But I thought the transfer or the transformation choice was a bit odd because we get that awkward Judge Reynolds naked in front of his son, like in the Hulk pants and ripped and (laughs) making comments about his penis. It's it's weird. But we're going to go with this that I like there is a, a twist from the normal formula. So in most of the I call them the body switch movies. Most of the characters, they all want to switch back and they spend the whole movie trying to figure out A, what happened and B, how do we stop it from happening and reverse it? Here, Fred Savage has no interest in going back. He wants to teach his dad, hey, my life isn't easy. I want you to experience it. So I like that we get a little twist on what's traditionally happening. I 100% agree with you, Big D, but holy shit, that wish moment it could not be more forced. Like someone decided that the way this is going to happen is there's going to be a ritual. You got to have two people touching the skull at the same time and making a wish to be each other. The odds of that happening within like a few days of finding the skull, they're astronomical. So you really got to sell those circumstances. So you got two options. You got to have some brilliant fucking writing that makes this seem plausible, or you got to make the movie campy where it's like so silly that that it would happen that that anybody would buy it and instead we we get neither it was the weirdest actual moment which should have been like the stunning climaxing and and ash i hate to again you know go with what you're saying but freaky friday they, they just made it such a loose transformation such a loose set of circumstances that that it makes sense whereas here it was just it was fucking weird nobody does that no i can guarantee you in the history of time no father and son were ever holding on to a skull <laughs> while wishing they could be each other <laughs> But anyway, it ends up happening. And I understand that Marshall is the vice president at his company, and there's this major shakeup on the East Asia account. But I would consider swapping bodies with your child or transforming into your child, it's a pretty good reason to miss work for a day. And even if you don't miss work for a day, this child can miss a day of school. Much like D&D, you never want to split up the party when a skull has transformed you into a little boy. You got to just fucking take a day, figure out what the fuck is going on. Maybe fuck with the skull a little bit and see if you could reverse the curse. Right. I mean, he gets a phone call and he's like, oh, no, you're going to be picked up to go to school in 20 minutes. Like, you don't have to actually go. Like, tell him he's sick. You don't have to get dressed. Like, even in, like, our plot description, I was laughing when I was reading it. It's like, they realize they have to live out to their lives as one another. Like, it, it happened, like, five minutes before. Like, it's not like they've had a lot of time to reflect. They transfer and then they just kind of, like, let's go off into our lives. And it's completely unnecessary. Now... Paul, we don't mean to dunk on this movie because there's a lot of good with it as well. And I was particularly impressed with Fred Savage. Like, I really enjoyed him in The Princess Bride and The Wonder Years. But goddamn, like, he's really good at playing an adult. It's something I hadn't seen done before. The way he holds the martinis, the way, like, frequently in the movie he just yells, holy shit, his conversations with other adults. Like, Fred Savage sounds like a grown-ass man. And and part of that might come from the fact that he was 13 years old when they made this movie. So he's playing an 11-year-old. But still, even at 13, like this is impressive. Uh, you cannot undersell that. And please listen, people. This is one of the best, I think, child performances. Now, granted, he is not an abused kid. This isn't the sixth sense where somebody's sharing that they're tormented. But these subtle nuances, Gene, made me really appreciate Fred Savage as, as an, an actor. It's the little subtle things, like where you've mentioned the martini. I loved it the way he held it. Mm-hmm. Or when he's trying to teach his son how to do a tie. Or the subtle shame he feels in the class when the teacher discovers the love note. 
or when he has the heart to heart with his son in the car about how him and his ex had met, how they got together, how she became pregnant, and the regret that he has about the past, but not the regret for Charlie, for his son. And there's a way that he captured, you could tell the Fred Savage, watch Judge Reinhold and picked up some of his mannerisms, some of his vocal cadence. There was an adult wisdom that you thought, this is a young Judge Reinhold. But Judge Reinhold, on the other half, he did not pull his weight. He just tried to be like, it seemed like it was like a a 1980s Bill or Ted, hey, everybody, yo, what's going on, man? It was definitely an uneven performance. Yeah, he's absolutely the worst job. For the first 15 minutes, the only acting decisions he makes to act like a kid is to open his eyes really big and speak really, really slowly. Like, Dad, <laughs> what's happening, Dad? <laughs> like, <laughs> it's so dumb in the way he so walks, bad. where like he flicks his arms all around, like he's super goofy. Like, Fred Savage did not walk like that the first part of this movie. Like, I don't know where that fucking came from. And if that's not cringe enough, I don't know about y'all, but y'all, this scene where they're playing the music, oh. I could not handle. He sits down to play the drums. They're like, Oh, he's like raging, man. And then the piano dude gets there and like he roughs up his hair. And then he basically hits three chords over and over again. And Charlie's barely playing. And I get that it's supposed to make it like cute and show how like he's loosened and martial up. But y'all, I just rolled my eyes and went, okay, this is really fucking dumb. Okay, Piano Man has a name. The music department salesman's name is Coleman. Sorry. And he does totally fuck up the jam. Like, it's going pretty well, and then he just fucks it up. But, man, Charlie on drums and, like, Tears for Fears guy laying down those licks. Like, that shit worked for me. I thought it was better than Tom Hanks playing piano, dancing chopsticks. And you get that great line in this where he's like, nice, Phil. <laughs> Fucking, it's so good. Dude, but but th- this is my thing. Fred. Sa- okay, Fred Savage is supposed to be – like an 11-year-old boy. 11-year-olds know I'm not going to sabotage my dad's career. I'm not I know what to do. I can behave. He's in the restaurant, he's sitting there and other than the frog, he is not throwing things around the room. He's being appropriate. Bro, they set it up. Music is his life. No, I know that. Mm-hmm. I know that. But young Charlie, Fred Savage doesn't walk around calling anyone, "Yo, dude." Yo, <laughs> never once does his character do that. No, once. he picks it. No, he's trying to fit in. He picks that up from the other guys. The other guys working at Avery are like, yo, uh, Marshall, yo. And so he's like, oh, you got to tell everybody yo at the office. Okay, okay mm-hmm. whatever. Come yeah. on, give him a break. Yeah. Charlie's mom, Robin, comes home earlier than expected and sees Charlie with a martini and is furious at both him and Marshall. After failing to get the skull back, By asking nicely, the thieves try to steal it. Charlie learns Marshall's boss has called a meeting to pull the plug on Marshall's business. Marshall uses a hidden radio to guide Charlie through the meeting, but Turk kidnaps Marshall, leaving Charlie to fend for himself in the boardroom. No longer able to speak eloquently, he stands up and lashes out in Marshall's defense before leaving the meeting. Okay, so I know this is this does not work because you need them to be going through this adventure alone. But I found myself, wouldn't you, Gene, if you swapped bodies, let's say young Gene with King B. Okay. You guys swapped bodies, <laughs> regardless of how it happened. You touched a skull, you made a wish, you peed into a fountain, whatever the hell you guys did that made you swap bodies. Wouldn't you reach out for help? Tell someone, tell anyone, tell a loved one, someone in your immediate family here. You could tell Sam, you could tell your ex, you know, I think that in big, it worked because Josh and Billy had to work together to get through the situation. And we missed that here. Yeah, but like, who are you going to tell? Like, who's going to believe you? Like, even if you're like, I'm going to prove it with my secrets or whatever. I don't think I would buy it. Like, I would still have you committed. Yeah, but he explains it to Turk with one simple line. You took a photo of us at the table in Thailand. Right, but again, I'm so cynical. I would figure that you just figured that out some other way. I would I just I would never ever buy that somebody body swapped. Yeah, I mean, I think people are more likely to believe you were abducted by aliens or met a ghost than you fucking transformed into your child's body. Like nobody is gonna believe a skull 
swapped our bodies. What's weird to me is that they never spent time like tinkering with the skull to reverse the curse. I would hole up or like go, hey, we're going on vacation to California, we're going to Disneyland and then spend like five <laughs> days trying to figure this shit out. Yes, I completely agree. The whole time I was like, just both grab onto the fucking skull again. Like, just wish again. And then we find out at the end, spoiler alert, that that was all they had to do was just touch it at the same time. Ugh. People have no common sense. So when we watched this movie, it was right around Valentine's Day. And maybe like the mood got to me and triggered my thirst receptors. But Big D mentioned when Marshall like gets that note and it accidentally gets slipped to his teacher and she thinks that he wrote her a love note. And she looks at him like, ooh. Yeah. I was thinking like, she's not so bad, the teacher. Which brings me to today's hot take. Sleeping with my female <laughs> teacher in fifth grade would have been rash. Awesome. Like not, awesome. not my teacher specifically because she was like 80 years old. But if you got an okay looking teacher and it's just a hookup, I think that's a net win for any boy. Oh, without a doubt. I don't care how politically correct it is and the problems we would have if the genders were reversed. Me as a boy at that age, it would be great. And, and Fred Savage here, he is 100% on board with hooking up with Sam. He doesn't care that Sam is his dad's girlfriend. He is all about it. He knows something is going to happen. He doesn't know exactly what it is, but he is in a man's body and it is raging with testosterone and hair and manliness. So when he's making out with Sam, you know, he's starting to get aroused and he wants to sneak Sam into his room without waking up Judge Reinhold, his dad. So he knows, he knows this is something that he wants to do. And after they passionately kiss, you know, and, and they're lingering on it and, you know, Judge Reinhold's got the, the smeared lipstick. I was hoping in some weird way that the final cut of the scene would be him standing there with just like a bulge in his pants. And it would be this awkward, like, hey, hey, because in big, we get where he pulls his pants out and he's making comments about about his penis. And I think here it would have been great to see Judge Reinhold in the state of arousal. Yeah, but the big difference here between big and this movie is that this is his son. Like, that's weird, right? It's got to be awkward AF to stand there and watch your girlfriend make out with who you know your kid is like who lets that kiss go on and i think that this proves that marshall's just an asshole because especially for the girlfriend like can you imagine if she found out that that's what was happening like i would completely announce my presence from the absolute start yeah like revenge of the nerds that's the that's rape right basically, right but but i think everyone deep down would would watch but they wouldn't stop the thing just out of morbid curiosity like okay example Big D, let's say there was a, a secret camera in Big D's shower. I come up <laughs> to my computer for work tomorrow. I log in and it's it's a feed from Big D shower. Now, I don't want to watch Big D take a shower, but of course I would watch. Oh, yeah. I'm, thank you. I appreciate it's like, it. It's like, it's, and it's not about, it's not about like, I want to see Big D naked, but like, how does he shower? What does he wash first? What's that look like? Is he weird in the shower? It's it's just curiosity. I think that that's totally different, though. I mean, of course I would watch Big D in the shower. Of course I would. Thank you. But the fact of the matter is, like, I know that Big D is not an 11 year old boy. Like, he does. It's just different. Uh, do you guys remember in Big, Susan actually has sex with 11 year old Josh multiple times, whether it's to advance her career or whatever, but she knowingly slept with that boy. So here, cool. maybe you're just trying to keep it in the family. I don't know. Gross. I thought it would have been better. I mean, because he's already making jokes about his penis. Dad, she said ball buster. And then he looks down and goes, oh, there's not much to bust here. Making fun yeah, of his son's there's, penis. There's a lot of... There's a lot of dick jokes. <laughs> Lots of movie. dick jokes. <laughs> also, when you think about it, like, this is why... Did they do that in Freaky Friday? Was she like, oh, my God, my tits and I'm menstruating? No, because she's already a teenager, so she already had tits and was menstruating. Really? That's how yeah. that works? Oh, cool. Just different. And also, I don't think that's the first thing a girl would do. The first thing a girl would do is not look at her boobs. Like, that isn't at all what would happen. I would, what would the my first body swap? Well, I would. Yeah, of course like, hey, you would. What would the first thing be? Yeah, what would the first thing be? Probably look at their bank account. No, <laughs> come on. Yeah. Bull no, no, I mean, we wouldn't, we wouldn't care at all about that. And like your vagina looks the same. It just gets a little bigger. So, like, we don't have that. Oh, the landscaping changes. Right. But if you've already hit puberty, the landscaping's already happening. So, wait, let's rewind back to this vagina gets bigger thing. Walk me through that. 
<laughs> what? With your vagina, it gets bigger. The vaginal canal expands as you get bigger. <laughs> oh, I thought you were talking about the gravity effect like we get. Oh, no. No, no, no. I'm not talking about the the Laffy Taffy thing. No. With Turk holding Marshall for (laughs) ransom, Charlie tries to get the skull back from the llama. Marshall tries to explain to the thieves that he is not himself and that he and Charlie have switched bodies because of the skull. He's trying to get help. Charlie arrives and trades the skull for Marshall. Once safe, they rush to reacquire the skull so they can switch themselves back. They catch up with Turk and Lillian just after the crooks themselves have accidentally switched bodies and take the skull back. So I know what this movie's about, and I could not help but feel some tension. As an adult watching this, every time that he encounters the department store owner or some of his colleagues or has to be in a situation to make business decisions, I found myself being honestly tense. Like, oh, what are you doing? You're going to screw this up. And when they call him into that big meeting, you know, about the the South China deal or whatever's going south. I'm like, nothing can good <laughs> come from. Run away, Charlie. Run away. Get out of there. You know, because I'm sorry. Am I wrong in saying that if if he said, well, if if you want that guy to be like me and who's going to like stay away from his family, well, you should give it to those three guys. And if you ran out of a meeting, Gene, you'd be instantly fired, wouldn't you? No. No, I've Same. I've gotten away with murder in the office, and I, I hope it's because my performance allows me to be a bit of a tyrant. But like, I think I get exception because I I do good work. Because I've, I mean, in the office, I have thrown a computer monitor. <gasps> I've I've screamed "fuck yeah, you" at a coworker. <gasps> I, I I told a CEO that he'd better start getting honest with us during an executive meeting. Uh, and then back when I was in newspapers, I walked out of a newsroom and told the copy chief he lacked any journalistic credibility. And out of all those things, only that last one cost me a job. The other ones all happened at the company where I am and have been for eight years. Wow. I mean, I had to meet with HR, <laughs> but I still got promoted and I never do got- you like, think there it's was- ca- See, but do you think that's because you're a dude, right? Because I feel like if I did that, it would be like, oh, she's emotionally unstable. Yeah. Plus Gene's kind of, he's a POC. You know, so you'd be like, oh, a POC. It's a, a person of color. Oh, well, he's oh, he's a POC. I get what you're saying. Yes, See, yes. I would. Ar- I would argue that if you're alternative enough at work, you get lumped in as a woman. Maybe not exactly <laughs> the same, but closer to that end of the spectrum. No, I really no, do. I'm They're so like, so sorry, oh, you do not get to claim that you get lumped in with women because you're alternative. <laughs> No, I'm saying not like alternative, like I listen to Nirvana and wear Vans. I'm talking like if you're like different enough, they're just like, oh, he's – they other you similarly. Like, not to the same extent. I mean like if I ever cried, which I only do like three times a year. But if I ever cried at work, like my career would be over. Yeah, because that's some woman shit. <laughs> Is she no. on a period? Is she like Ripley? Is she going to go get the cat? <laughs> don't allow her on spacecraft or executive meetings or near a nuclear football that's why girls can't be president anger is an emotion guys anger is an emotion thank you the police arrest charlie for possible kidnapping and cliff his stepdad bails him out sam shows up and reports that marshall still has a job despite charlie's outburst he asks sam to take him home so that he can give charlie a present on the way charlie proposes to sam Marshall and Charlie use the skull to switch back to their own bodies, and Marshall then goes to see Sam while Charlie listens in to their conversation about the proposal. Though initially caught off guard, Marshall relents and embraces the proposal Charlie made for him. So I hate to say it, but this movie has a message, and I don't hate it. I didn't get that feeling of like, oh, gross, the feeling I get from Stephen King movies. The message is all kids could benefit from being a little more grown up. And all adults could benefit from being a little less uptight. And granted, this movie is full of messages and most of them suck, but that one's good. There are other ones like all Asians are are mystics or shady or that Amtrak trains actually follow a schedule. But overall, I think vice versa dared to be thoughtful, which is like risky for a comedy. If you're doing it in a drama, it's one thing. But for comedies, you don't have to throw in that element of a, of a lesson or a message. And when you do, you are truly rolling the dice. I'm so confused as to who you are right now, because when I was watching this movie, I was like, you know what? 
Gene's going to get this. He's going to get how heavy handed this is and how this fucking message you're talking about that they're so brave to have was telegraphed from like the opening of the movie. And I'd be fine with the message if it wasn't so heavy handed. And the other issue I have with it is like, I believe Charlie learns his lesson. I think that he sees that being a grown up is really hard, that he needs to be more grown up, that he needs to be more understanding of the grown ups in his life. But does Marshall really learn anything? Like, because he's still kind of a dick at the end. And I think the worst mistake that Charlie made was getting this poor girl to agree to marry his dad, because I do not think that he's ready for fucking marriage. And if we saw like vice versa too, like, I don't think they're going to be married, guys. No, 100%. I agree. When, when, When she says, well, did you tell him? Oh, tell him what? That I said yes. And you can see the fear and the tension building in Judge Reinhold's eyes. He goes, oh, yeah, there's no way the engagement stays. There's Because no, his eyes told me he did not think this was a good idea. Nope. And, and Ash, you mentioned what's next here. If we just follow the logic of this movie, what happens next? You remember Tina and Turk, the villains of the movie, when they get over the shock of swapping bodies, they're going to want to swap back. They're going to deduce, hey, The way the kid was acting, the knowledge of what had happened to his father, it has to be that skull. They're going to go back to the one place that it was known to be, Marshall's apartment. And guess what? That's where Marshall's taking it. If we could see the following weeks of Marshall's life, I think Turk takes that gun that he's got, and he's going to go up to the apartment, and he is going to use it on Marshall. There is no way they're going to not unswap the bodies, and I don't think Marshall's going to be a willing accomplice to that. I couldn't agree more. I was like, oh, okay, well, there's a plot hole. Like, I actually watched through the credits because I was like, well, maybe this is like a post credit scene where we get to figure out what happens to them. And we get that one scene where they've switched bodies. And so, like, they're in each other's clothing. And that's a pretty funny sight gag. But then it's like, oh, they're just going to be out there being each other. Which kind of brings me to a question, I guess, for the pod in general. Would you rather transform into a child okay or transform into a man or woman depending on on oh. your current oh, sex be a fucking man and a heartbeat heartbeat i would want to have sex as a woman 100 okay i i really appreciate right now our reason through this because my reason to become a dude has nothing to do with fucking anything with a dick oh, nice. well mine does mine does and I promise you, sex as a woman is not that interesting. Well, I'll be the judge of that after I have it. I can't okay. do that as a child. Have fun trying to get that vaginal orgasm. Have fun, <laughs> guys. I mean, Big D, you hook up the shower cam. Maybe I can help you out a little bit. Oh, I like it. I, like it. <laughs> I want to address two quick things as we're coming to an end here. Number one, Ash, how the hell did you not scream at your TV when we get a RoboJocks level stuntman? <laughs> we get in that police chase. It is clearly a small adult trying to crouch (laughs) down. I kept thinking, oh, my God, Ash has to be screaming and banging on the multiple TVs in her house and slapping Pierre's iPad out of his hands (laughs) because Ash, she's upset at this. But the the last thing, I mentioned this to Gene before we recorded. (laughs) The movie has this weird fascination with the penises of the adult and the child in this movie. We get to the end and they're going to switch back. And they realize, oh, I don't want to ruin my pajamas. Let's both get naked. (laughs) This is right after Judge Reinhold has been arrested for taking his son on a police chase. Okay, And if you walked out as a cop and found him naked in your son's room, squatting over a gold and diamond encrusted skull, what are you going to do? It's the funniest part of the movie. It is. It's the funniest part of the movie because they're like, they're like, oh, what do we got to do? Well, of course we should take our clothes off. And then you think about all the things that there's a cop in the house, his mom's in the house. She wakes up. She's so like, oh, shit, they're going to get caught. They're naked. And then, you know, Judge Reinhold's got this like goofy look on his face because he's an 11 year old still. And he's like, oh, and then they, and then they got to sit like they got to sit like cross legged on the yes. floor. Yeah. With this skull, and I'm just like, just the mental image of all of that happening in the room together. I'm like, I was laughing at the potential, and then intelligently, they didn't go there and make it some big farcical thing. It was just you, you understood what could have happened, and it was funny enough. Agreed. Well, now is the time in the podcast where we give our wipe score for the movie we're covering. This week, it's vice versa. Zero wipes is a perfect movie, is undergoing a body transformation and waking up with Judge Reinhold's dick. Five Wipes is an absolute disaster. It is Coleman on the keyboards. Ash, we'll start with you. What is your wipe score 
for vice versa. So I think this movie's fine. Um, I know it can't help but be compared to Big. And personally, I think that Big is a lot better. And it's for one reason. It's because of Tom Hanks. I think that Tom Hanks is so damn charming in that movie. He's wonderful in it. And he plays that character where it feels like he is a kid, but he still looks like an adult. And I think that's what's missing from here. I think Fred Savage is precious in this movie. I think he carries it on his back. I think he's wonderful in it, but I think the weight is too much and it collapses on him because Judge Reinhold is just not that great in this movie. I don't think he's as good as Tom Hanks, and I don't think he's as good as Jamie Lee Curtis in the 2003 remake of Freaky Friday. I think that he's just not. Um, It's a silly film. It's not awful, though. I mean, I, I didn't hate it. The time passed fairly quickly, and it was cute. And so I'm going to give it just a slightly worse than average score of three wipes. Ash, I'm going to follow your Tom Hanks math here, and I'm going to okay. say that Judge Reinhold is like half a Hanks, right? Okay. So you I'll go half you a Hanks, you give a Savage is one Hanks, so that's at one and a half Hanks. Mm. And Big didn't have the cock rock stylings of Malice to up the ante. Malice was awesome. I was singing the Malice songs like like all week long, uh, which, by the way, set the night to music until I saw the credits for Vice Versa. I always thought was say goodbye to music. <laughs> it's totally different. Very set different. the night to music. It's much more romantic than say goodbye to music, which sounds dark and cryptic. Anyway, uh, I'm going to come in just a little bit better than average at two wipes. I am so surprised at how much I enjoyed this movie. I really had fun. I thought it was going to be just just difficult to get through. But Ash, I agree with you. I think Big is, it's a better movie. I mean, it is a much better film, but is it more fun? I don't necessarily think so. I think this is goofy. This is enjoyable. They don't try to explain it. It's more about having fun, whereas Big is soul crushing. It is about losing the innocence of being a child and realizing what it's like to go have to work a full-time job, and it's not nearly as fun. Uh, I think Judge Reinhold, he should be embarrassed. He Every day he should have left the set with, hanging his head that young Fred Savage was taking him to school, that he could not hang with this young actor. But I, I think it much better than I expected. Is it great? No, but it is a two-white movie. It is better than average. All right, with two wipes from me and Big D and three wipes from Ash, that gives us an average wipe score of 2.3 repeating wipes for vice versa. So Gene, with a score of 2.3 repeating wipes, that now ties us in. I mean, this is this is a big block of films here at the 135 spot. Uh, so I'm going to run through them for you. Rocky Four, Point Break, Casino, Demolition Man, The Money Pit, Bram Stoker's Dracula, The Santa Claus, Ronin, Young Gun, Species, Harley Davidson, The Marlboro Man, and The Great Outdoors. Yeah, we might have been too kind. This is not as good as any of those movies. No. Woof. My score was better. <laughs> it's a different movie. Come on, guys. Don't- yeah, but Dracula. I know. Point Break. I know. <laughs> guys, I think this is the first time I got to say, yeah, it didn't work. The white system did not work this time. <laughs> the system uh, failed us. No, no. I think it was your Hank's math, Gene. That's what fucked us here. It was your Hank math. Maybe yeah. people, maybe some other people were just too cruel to uh, those other movies. Yeah, those weren't Big me. D. No, I'm please. What was your Dracula score? My Dracula score. My Dracula mm-hmm. score was oh, it, it's what I thought it was fair. I thought it was a uh, one. Uh, what did I, hold on, I thought it was <laughs> Dracula. I thought it was a, a four white movie. I can't. <gasps> help. Oh, Wait, uh, okay. That's what this screen. That's what this website says. I don't know if I can. <laughs> I, this I, website I, that I run. That, well, you know, it's when you're doing like the, it's this crazy spreadsheet. <laughs> I don't know if this website thing. is right. I, I, okay, listen, I have found errors before, so I'll go back and check on it. I don't think I could have given it a four. I don't know about that. I'll have to check that. I'll have to check. What that. did we give it? Uh, hold. Were you on that one, Ash? Because hold on, maybe there's a there is definitely a problem. Oh no, I wasn't. I wasn't here yet. Was I? Okay, that's what, so. Yeah, so I gave it a four. Roger gave it a one point five, and it looks like Gene gave it a one point five. I would have given it probably a 1.25 or 1.5, yeah. So, I mean, other than that, like Harley Davidson, Marlboro Man, I gave four and a half, and you it's both gave it a one and a one and a half, which I yeah, thought was Yeah, because it was great. It's a lot of fun. You, you guys are just terrible. 
Point Break, again, Roger screwed that with a 3.5. Rocky Four, Roger screwed that with another 3.5. So the formula does work if you respect it. Now, I'm going to go back and check so... mathematically if Bram Stoker, if I actually <laughs> gave it a not four. respect here? If I gave it a four, then I'll, I'll go back and I'll adjust it. And also, mm-hmm. Roger gave Demolition Man a four. Seriously. Dracula is a beautiful love story that uh, we would I'll all be to lucky to I'll experience in our lives. Uh, tune in to shatthepod.com and I'll, I'll I'll come back and check on that for you. <laughs> Man's got coconuts pod. for brains. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Paul, so much uh, for this commission. We've got a ton of voicemail that's been coming in and we appreciate you guys calling in and leaving us those messages. 914-719-SHAT or you can go to shatpod.com and use the speak pipe feature uh, to leave us a voicemail there. Uh, This week's first voicemail comes from Chris D, and it's about Ravenous. Hey, guys. uh, Sorry for the late message, um, but I'm a a mariner by trade, and I I just got into port after 19 days at sea. Um, I do try and download as many podcasts as I can before I leave, and I I always save the best ones um, for the back end of the voyage. Um, So it gives me something to look forward to. So I can say with absolute certainty that I listen to the Ravenous, uh, podcast and it blew me away because you never really know what a dick you can sound like until your favorite <laughs> podcast hosts call you out on it. Uh, I am so sorry. It, it, it doesn't matter what I meant to say. It only matters how it was heard. Uh, my deepest apologies to, to everyone, especially you, Ash, for the offense. Um, I've found out late in life that uh, sarcasm is my love language, but I forget sometimes that nobody knows that. I am truly sorry. I honestly appreciate the hard work each of you put into the podcast each week, um, every week, week in, week out. I hope you can forgive me, and I promise to only comment with the like or love button in the future. Uh, Thank you, guys. Uh, Christopher. So for anybody who's lost about what Chris said, uh, Chris is the guy who wrote and he's like, finally, they're doing a movie that some of us have seen. Not all these like random obscure movies or whatever. He was being sarcastic. And I think he said something like, yeah, even Ash has seen this one. And uh, yeah, so I, I, I put Chris on blast. Now I feel terrible. You sound like the nicest guy in the world, Chris. Also, I love the fact that he was like out to sea. Yes. You know, and then on his it's like returning to port. He's like, ah, oh, I'm just going to listen to my favorite podcast, even the best for last. And the worst is he can't reply. So yeah. he's just feeling even worse about it. I just, we, we should have known because this was following Father of the Bride, Titanic, yeah. A League of Their Own, you know, Bull Durham, <laughs> Stand By Me. So it's on us too. I just appreciate the out that you just gave me that sarcasm can be a love language. I think that's going to be my new one, sarcasm and cynicism. So thanks so much for that. Appreciate it. And I wasn't offended, by the way. I wasn't offended. I it was. was. Okay. I know. You were. <laughs> Very deep, Deeply wounded that by me. that one, Chris. <laughs> Gutted me. All right. Uh, next up, we have a voicemail from Joe in Denmark uh, for Ash. Hi, Jack Crew. Uh, my name is Joe, and I'm an American living in Denmark. I really enjoyed your recent review of Alien. And for me, the first two installments of the Alien franchise uh, really remind me of the Terminator series, where you know the first Alien and Terminator were kind of you know, watershed moments in filmmaking that so perfectly blended sci-fi with horror, where the follow-up Aliens and T2 merged sci-fi with just like kick-ass action. And I guess it's no coincidence that James Cameron had a hand in both. Uh, my comment refers to your review of the first Terminator uh, from a long, long time ago, where one of the hosts on that episode, I think, was a, a one-time guest. I forget his name. And I really think cool. he did a disservice uh, to the film in giving it like a two and a half or three wiper, which brought down the average score. So given the recent review of Alien and his deservedly awesome score, and I guess kind of falling under that same sci-fi horror genre, I was curious if Ash might um, kindly offer her unofficial score, maybe even just her thoughts. I know it's a random request and, and feel free to ignore, but I guess I would be remiss if I didn't do a small part in helping to give justice to the first uh, Terminator film, which is one of my favorites. Um, thanks for everything you guys do. Absolutely love the show. And I really do my best in spreading the word of Shat um, throughout Scandinavia over here. Uh, take care, guys. Have a great day. So I am a huge Terminator fan. Um, I actually had some pre- time to think about this because Jean mentioned that this voicemail was there. So I did a lot of thinking 
And I think I probably would give the first Terminator somewhere between like a 0.25 or 0.5 wipes. T2, I would say it's perfect. But the first Terminator, probably 0.25. So this is not unprecedented. Uh, the When the entire Blade Runner debacle happened, we did allow Carrie Gross to, to add her score. So I went back and I looked and Ash, it looks like at some point I had asked you mm-hmm. and you had submitted a 0.5. So I yeah. do have that worked into the formula. So it, even though on the review, it was Cole Pickock and Cole's a good friend of mine. And to this day, I talk about how he gets more hate mail than any other host we've ever had on. And and he's he's proud to wear that badge of just just shame. So if you go back there and you look, the Terminator has a one wipe average because we added ashes in to balance out Cole Pickock. Yeah, I mean, I I said point five at the time. I think that I rewatched it recently. I, that's fine. We can go with point five. But Terminator's fucking great, man. Anything with Michael Bean. Mm. Well, if you if you rewatched it recently, because I don't think at that point you had, I will update it to point two five. Yeah, I would say. Well, I just out of curiosity, what were y'all's? Uh, the Terminator for us. Uh, one second, sorry, I had it. It is uh, both Gene and I gave a point five. Oh, nice. Okay. Yep. So you're you're in there. So I'm right in there with you. Cool. Ash, I don't I don't want to kill the love for Michael Bean, but I do want to remind you of the seventh sign. Oh God, he was so bad on that. Yeah, it's pretty. But I mean, but like, but it was a bad movie. But Terminator, Michael Bean, like, makes you feel all wiggly. He's good. I like him. Also, Judge Reinhold has proven that you can do a great job in a bad movie. So I don't know what you guys are talking about. Or a mediocre one. That way, we don't tie with Bram Stoker's Dracula, the greatest love story of all time. So thanks so much. I think that's a that's a data error. I don't believe that for white score. I do because of what you gave Red Dawn. <laughs> I believe any score because of what you gave Red Dawn. I, I'm never going to apologize we have for no being faith a patriotic, red blooded American. I no love faith. Wolverines. <laughs> Big D, we've got. Uh, and speaking of being a patriotic, red blooded American, Big D, we've got a voicemail from you. Uh, it's an um actually about in the army now. Oh no. Hey guys, um, first time caller, long time listener. Um, <clears throat> I guess this is um actually. In your last episode with aliens, someone called in with an um actually to, in reference to the In the Army episode where you mentioned Dan Aykroyd in Stripes. And then Big D said Stripes was a movie that Harold Ramis and Bill Murray had a falling out. It is actually Groundhog Day. How do I know that? I'm a huge Harold Ramis, Bill Murray, Ghostbuster fan. And Groundhog Day was the movie that caused the big rift between Harold Ramis and Bill Murray until... Until what? What's he doing? Did he get killed? <laughs> what's, what's he doing? <laughs> Bill, he got Bill Murray. <laughs> so, yeah. the, chive, the chive got him. Yeah, so he, he is correct. That did, but I believe that this movie started the the problem with Ivan Reitman, if I'm correct. I'd have to go back and research it, but he's right. The falling out was Groundhog's Day. I'm um, actually. And finally, to close this out for this episode, uh, we have longtime listener Tom in Crane, Texas, again, asking Ash to correct some scores. Tom, Crane, Texas. How did shot crew? I was called in after listening to your American Werewolf in London podcast, and I have an idea for you all to consider. Um, since Roger did so many near perfect or perfect movies, a grave injustice with his white score, I was wondering if since you got Big D, Gene, who have always give each movie a fair chance with their white score, and now Ashley, who always does an excellent job giving each movie a fair chance with her white score, I was wondering if those nearly near perfect and perfect movies Rogers did so wrong. I was wondering if you all could go back and review those movies and give them the updated white scores that each of those movies deserve. Thank you for listening, and I hope you all will consider my idea, 
and I hope to hear back from you all. Thank you so very much, and I hope you all have a great week. Well, Tom, you know, I'm glad that we actually just had the voicemail about adjusting some scores. I don't believe in wiping Roger's scores off the books, but if Ash does watch a movie and she, I trust her and she sits Blade down Runner and she, is zero. When's the last time you watched it? If you sit down and about sit, do, four weeks ago with my dad, what in version? her kitchen, which of the 17 versions, the director's cut, were you making ramen? No. And you sat down, you watched it, and yes, and it's one of my favorite Gene, movies. G- listen, here's the soundtrack. What's that lady doing with the snake? I don't know. Is it going to rain all day? Probably. Okay, Ash is not asleep, so she actually did make it to the movie. Mm-hmm. You think it's zero? Oh, it is a perfect fucking movie. Yeah. All right, yeah. I got an idea. I got an idea. Okay, so we're having our Mardi Gras party coming up yes! March first. Why don't we line up? A string of movies where you and I, Big D, gave it near perfect and Raj bombed it. And we give Ash rapid fire scores on all those movies. Tom, we could package that up for you. I know you don't uh, hang out on Twitch, but I could put it on uh, on YouTube and I can email you with it. And uh, you can see all of Ash's scores that she would give those movies. And then and of what course, they would have been. Yeah. And what they would be with those scores. Zero white Blade Runner. Okay. And Ash, again, if you do actually watch them and you put in the thought. Not like, oh, I remember. Wow. No, no. What I'm saying is it's not like. It's dangerous when women think. Ah, we try to keep them down in the kitchen. No, if it's like you thought, oh, I remember this movie. But if you actually sat and watched it four weeks ago, I think Blade Runner, I will add your score. Zero. Yeah. <laughs> but you have to have watched it within, let's just say. I literally watched days. it about four weeks ago you, with my dad when he was Jean's here for Mardi Fence Gras. Party. Okay. Fine. But for Mardi Gras, she can give them any scores, even if she hasn't seen it recently, right? Right. But that one won't. Unless she's seen it recently, we won't add them into the formal archives. I'm very excited. All right. March 1st. You know, Ash, you know, Mardi Gras plans? <sighs> I live in Houston now. I, well, I, just, I don't know. Maybe you're going to throw beads at your children or something. I have no idea. Well, yeah. But then I will get drunk with you online. Oh, okay. Cool. Those are my All plans. All right. Sweet. All right, guys. So March 1st, 8 o'clock Eastern, 7 o'clock Central, Perfect. 6 o'clock at chatpod.com slash twitch and if you miss it you can still catch it on youtube uh, a couple days later i'll be sure to post it on there too so i'll be there ash will be there big deal be there we'll be doing drinks uh we'll be doing lanyap and ash will be giving her corrections as prescribed by tom in crane texas thanks tom for calling in if you'd like to call in again our number is 914-719-chat or you can email us host at chatthemovies.com big d what do we have coming up next week so gene next week Billy Hoyle is a white basketball hustler who banks on black players underestimating his skills on the court. When he pulls an over on Sidney Dean, his victim sees a lucrative opportunity, and they become partners in a con game, plying their trade across the courts of Los Angeles. Meanwhile, Billy has to keep one step ahead of the mobsters to whom he owes money and staying on the good side of Jeopardy-obsessed motor mouth wife. Don Sauce commissioned this as the basketball winner for the Shat Podcast Fantasy Basketball League. It came out in 1992. And uh, it'll be interesting to watch this one again because I remember really liking this. All right. Well, thanks, Don, for commissioning the upcoming movie. Thank you, Paul, for commissioning Vice Versa. Thank you to all the commissioners who make this podcast possible. That concludes this week's episode of Shat the Movies. Be sure to follow us on social media and share with a friend. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, and Instagram at Shat the Movies. You can email us, host at shatthemovies.com, or call 914-719-SHAT. Support the podcast by shopping our Amazon affiliate link, buying our merch, or commissioning your own movie. Find all that information by visiting our website, shatpod.com. Also, you can check out our sister podcast, Chat on TV, we review TV series such as Lovecraft Country, Westworld, True Detective, Taboo, American Gods, Game of Thrones, and Watchmen. Wherever I find podcasts can be found, including iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe, and if you stop by iTunes, please leave a five-star review. That helps the podcast grow. On behalf of my co-hosts, Big D and Ash, I'm Gene Lyons. Be sure to join us next week for the following movie. Oh, it is hard work being this good. Oh, oh, it hurts. It's not about black. I don't mean to brag, but I'm the greatest. That's because you never saw me. It's not about white. Honey, I'm home. How much money did you make today? I missed you too. I'm sorry, honey. It's about green. I want to find out how good you are, chump. Come on! Come on! I'm your white shadow. I have a business proposal for you, as if you don't mind hustling. What kind of hustle? 
$500, baby, and you can pick my teammate. Give him the chump. You mean play basketball? Hey, pretty boy, I got something for you. Shut your anorexic, malnutrition, tapeworm having, overdose, Dick Gregory, Bahamian diet drinking ass up. Give me my money. I see you hustle. Hey, I never use those goofy white mother. Hey, who you calling goofy white mother? You, you. Five hundred divided by two. How much do you love me? I love you, Infinity. Oh, Billy, you're so stupid. You should have said I love you, Infinity plus Infinity. We shoot you, Billy, but first we want the money. There are rules to hustling. There's an ethics involved. Yeah, that you wouldn't know a damn thing about. <laughs> Will you explain to this Gladys Knight and the pimps? It's pips! The pips! Winning and losing is all one big organic globule. I hate it when you talk like that. Oh, you got that big Z in your fro, man. What are you, the Black Zorro? What are you doing? I'm doing two things. What? I'm making them mad. Most guys don't play good when they're mad. Look, you know you're embarrassing me. That's what you're doing. Yeah, well, that's the other thing I'm doing. I only have four words for you. White men can jump. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 